Okay, welcome back everyone. Hope you had plenty to eat and drink over our lunch break. Uh, before I introduce the next panel, just like to remind you all in your packs that you were given, there's a declaration in there from CEMB and it's regarding uh, the issue at the uh, Pride event and East London Mall. So if you just take a, a minute to look at that, please. Um, right, our next panel is called Out Loud and Proud, and some of them are loud, just to warn you. Um, and to chair this uh, discussion is Dan Barker, who's co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation and co-host of Free Thought Radio, which is a national weekly talk show. Uh, he is an atheist now, but uh, before that, he was a Christian preacher for 19 years, which I'm sure he'll tell you all about that. Um, he regularly travels uh, the country and the world giving lectures, performing concerts and participating in debates with theists, uh, many at colleges and university campuses. Um, so please can we all give a big round of applause to our next panel. So there was an atheist woman she was married to this Christian husband. He was a nice guy. He was a progressive, tolerant Christian. Somehow they made it work. They loved each other. He invited her to church one Sunday, and she said, sure, why not? I'll go to church with you. I'll see what you're doing. They went. There was this, Bened there was this invocation, and the choir sang, and they had announcements, and they passed the offering plate, and then there was this long, elaborate sermon from the minister and there was a closing benediction. And after the service, the minister went up to the woman and, she sa and he said, it's so nice to see you in church today. So do you believe now? Do you believe? And she said, yes. After sitting through your sermon, I now believe in eternity. <laughs> <laughs> eternity. <laughs> Some things are hard to believe. Last November, in the presidential election when Donald Trump was elected president, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, a national organization of atheists and agnostics, we had about 23,000 members. Today, we have much more than 29,000 members, close to 30,000 members now working to keep state and church separate. But there's got to be a better way to grow an organization. <laughs> We were traveling down to uh, Tennessee this last week, Annie Laurie and I and some of our staff, for the installation of a Clarence Darrow statue at the courthouse in Dayton where the famous 1925 monkey trial took place. There was a statue of William Jennings Bryan, the creationist, but until now there has not been a statue of Clarence Darrow. And uh, the Freedom From Religion Foundation raised the funds for that. And when I was on the plane coming home, I was wearing this hat. Can you see it? out of the closet atheist. And I like to wear this hat all over the place. I don't know what, what happened in your country necessarily, but uh, when I was getting off the plane, one of the young flight attendants said, yes, great hat, I'm with you 100%. That was really, really exciting. But coming here on Wednesday, we got on the same airline, an older woman flight attendant said, what does your hat say? And she read it. And then she grimaced and she just stormed off and off. So that shows you the, uh, the harassment that we atheists in the United States have to face because of our views. I was a fundamentalist Christian preacher for 19 years. My dad's family is American Indian. So I'm American in many different ways. Uh, but our tribe was Christianized in the 1830s by European Christians with guns and Bibles who had the right way to live. And I was raised in a family that was strictly Bible-believing, creationist, second coming of Jesus, out on the street preaching to win souls. And I changed my mind. And I tell that story in my book, Godless, uh, how an evangelical preacher became one of America's leading atheists. And surprising to me, coming out loud and proud as an atheist, I did lose some friends, that happens and I lost contact with some family members. But I was totally shocked that my mother and father, who were lifelong fundamentalist believers, eventually did their own thinking. They both became atheists as well. Isn't that something? Yeah. 
you don't know what's going to happen. You, you think you have all these fears. One of my brothers, Daryl, he was, what he said was once his older brother came out and articulated these things, it like, it gave him permission to say, yeah, I've had those doubts too. And so someone else has them too, and it gave him permission to think for himself. My mother told a reporter a few years after she became an atheist, it's so nice now living free from religion. I don't have to hate anymore. She could just accept people for who they are and for what they are. So being out loud and proud has many different repercussions and depending what country you're from, what community you're from. And uh, I think in the United States, what's happening is similar to what happened in the gay rights movement. As more and more people realize that they have a friend or a relative who's gay, the social acceptance of homosexuality has risen. That battle is now being won in the social arena. And I think we're starting to see that happen. I think the United States is about to catch up with Europe when it comes to secularism. We're sort of envious of how most Europeans, in spite of a big history of intolerance and holy wars and 30 years wars over s things as silly as um, infant baptism or, or transubstantiation, now most Europeans are pretty much like live and let live on that issue with some exceptions. So I think that's happening in my country as well. But I do know that in other parts of the world and other communities, it is not quite as easy to come out. We have our, our blowback, we have the uh, repercussions of being uh, um, out and loud and proud, whatever you call yourselves, atheist, agnostic, secular humanist, non-believer, none of the above. At the Freedom From Religion Foundation, we like to say, we don't care what label you put on yourself, we all disbelieve in the same God. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very distinguished panel today. Everybody knows Armin Navabi from Atheist Republic. <laughs> Armin is from Iran. He took religion seriously, which is why he is now no longer religious. <laughs> Asher Feynman. I don't know much about you, I, we just met, but uh, a student, and you, maybe you can tell us what you're studying. Uh, he is a co-founder of the Right to Debate campaign, which is advocating for free speech on university campuses. He's a president of the Goldsmiths Atheist, Secular, and Humanist Society. <laughs> and then Jamal Knudsen, the C is pronounced like a J, he just told me, Jamal Knudsen. Yusel, uh, born in Turkey, but he's now the co-founder and chair of Ex-Muslims of Norway. I never would have thought there'd be such a group, but that's amazing. Uh, and he came out of uh, what was associated with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, back in Turkey, so he's got quite a story to tell. Jimmy Bangash, uh, he's an um, ex-Muslim Pakistani, and uh, he's a gay British activist who is now committed to being out loud and proud in many different ways. Mohammed al Qadra, who is the founder of Jordanian Atheist Group. He lives in Jordan, still is active there as an activist in Jordan, who, uh, by the way, said that he's spoken a lot, but this is his first public speaking, so be kind to him today. <laughs> and then another uh, American here on the panel, <coughs> Noura Mbebi. She's Egyptian-American, born and raised, and lives in New York City. And she's currently the president of a group called Muslimish, which, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, Muslimish is not just ex-Muslims, but it's also those who are in the process of becoming, so they are transitioning out. So today, uh, we're going to let them talk now. And uh, what I'm going to suggest is that you each take about five minutes. <laughs> Maybe we'll start with Jimmy and we'll go down this way so that um, you s okay. So um, we'll take about five minutes, four or five minutes each, tell a little of your story, and then I want to ask each of you the same question. It's a three-part question. In your country or your community, what are the pluses of being out and loud and proud with your beliefs or non-beliefs? What are the minuses in your particular community? And then do the pluses outweigh the minuses? And then I would think that during questions, somebody might ask, then what do we do about it? But I would like to hear each of your particular community and country, what it is like being out and loud. 
we, we, we'll just go down the line here. Did you want me to do best, worst, and all in one go, or are you going to... No, do, do it all at one. Okay. Yeah, do all at one. Sure. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, guys, when I was 23 years old, I came out to my family as gay. And I was disowned for about 10 years, and that disownership was predominantly um, orchestrated by the men in my family rather than uh, the women. And uh, for LGBT people in the Muslim community, frequently um, you are told or, or given a forced apostasy. So you're told that if you're gay, you can't be Muslim, or if you're Muslim, you can't be gay. And so it kind of goes hand in hand that actually if you're coming out as gay, then you are also uh, an apostate. And frequently, the journey to apostasy for many of us is fraught with trauma. And often how we describe that trauma is as a segue to our politics or a segue to our activism. So. I was disowned when I was 23 years old, and now I think that blasphemy laws um, should be diminished. But what we don't tend to do is dwell on the conversation of trauma when we're in the company or when we're having the discussion around apostasy. So you seldom hear the dialogue of, when I was 23, I was disowned by my family, and it was orchestrated by the men. And for the next 10 years of my life, every single romantic relationship I tried to enter into was built on this foundation of abandonment issues. And I would find myself helplessly acting out and instigating arguments with the men who were romantically involved with me in my life so that I could evidence that no male would ever love me and that no male would ever be there for me and all men would abandon me in the way that my family had abandoned me. And we don't have these conversations and we don't talk about this. And I find it really interesting because what are we afraid of? Are we afraid or do we believe that by not dwelling on our trauma and actually just looking at our politics and our activism somehow we are going to be unimpacted by those traumatic experiences. And anyone who knows anything about that knows that that's farcical. By not spending any time getting to know your trauma, you won't understand how it's acting out in your life in the many, many subconscious ways. And one of the best things about being in, in somewhere like the UK is the access to deconstructing the myths and stigma around mental health. And it's time to start having a conversation about mental health in the apostate community. And we load our, we load our, our conversations about mental health with uh, a tarnishing of shame. And it's important to look at that shame because as somebody who's from a community that is religious, and this is whether you're an ex-Jehovah's Witness or whether you're an ex-Muslim, if you are transparent about your declaration of anxiety or depression or whatever um, mental health state you may be experiencing a challenge with, there's something there about equipping the religion that you have apostatized from with the ability to say, look at him, Allah has punished him, this is why he's depressed. Or look at her, demons have possessed her, just like how we say in Jehovah's Witnesses, and therefore she is suffering this anxiety and these panic attacks. And we mustn't allow that to silence us from sharing the trauma that we're going through, because only by communally having these conversations we will be able to navigate through them. And for those of us who have navigated through them and are well-adjusted individuals, it is important that we are sharing these experiences because it opens up a dialogue for others. So I guess the invitation is, is that we look in, if we look at the UK and how organizations like, like even like Amazon or whatever corporate 
organization you look at and how they invest in their employees' well-being around mental health. And we need to start doing this in our communities because we suffer from activist burnout and our work is fraught with emotion and it's fraught with conflict and it's fraught with animosity. And when activists burn out, frequently they don't come back to the cause. So we need to look at how do we support these people in terms of their mental health to ensure that the generation ahead of, behind us has leadership that will allow them to grow and deal with the, the conflict dialogues that they tend to have. So the best thing, I guess, in answer to your question is to be you know, in a Western liberal democracy where mental health is something that we're breaking down the stigmas around and we really need to approach that and adopt it in our own communities and also in our activist organizations. What are we doing to support activists so that their mental health is of paramount importance? Um, I guess if we're looking at what the worst things are, and, and guys, I don't mean to be confrontational today, but I'm going to say something that might be quite confronting. And I'm opening this as an introduction to the conversation rather than saying this is how it is because my mind isn't made up on this. I'm beginning to struggle, just beginning, to struggle with the idea that I have to use the word Islamist and Islamism instead of Muslim. And I want to explain what that struggle is, and perhaps somebody on the panel or in the audience can educate me because I'm really up for being more informed. When I read studies that say 52% of British Muslims want to criminalize homosexuality, and that 0% of uh, British Muslims think that homosexuality is moral, when I look at Javed Chowdhury, who's 24 years old and got married to a white guy and was out about it and proud about being Muslim and gay, and now I read that he's getting acid attacks, threats, and people are spitting on him as he walks to the corner shop to get his milk. I struggle to identify that as Islamist, as some faraway concept of Taliban or of ISIS or some fundamentalist religious leader in a mosque who, who is galvanizing hate towards homosexuals. Because intrinsically, the LGBT experience within Muslim communities is intrinsically linked to fear, death, and intimidation. And so when I look at this, I must say Islamist instead of Muslim. I must say Islamism instead of Islam. I feel a little bit like I'm being silenced and disingenuous because it's a dominant norm. Like it's a dominant norm, the hostility towards LGBT people in our community. And that's one of the things I'm really struggling. Certainly it's not the worst, but it's something I'm struggling with at the moment. And then what was the last part of the question? Do the pluses outweigh the minuses? Yeah, I mean, definitely. So I think, you know, living in a Western liberal democracy, it's, it's better to be out both as gay and better to be out as an apostate. And I'll tie this back to the start of my answer, which was about mental health is the challenges you experience as a, a gay man splitting your identity in two, so pretending to be heterosexual, it may be in the Muslim environment whilst you're homosexual in your gay environments, is damaging to your mental health. And similarly, compounding that with a splitting of your apostasy identity is also uh, damaging. So this ability, which is very much a Western privilege, I, 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 I've not disconnected from that reality. But what it allows me to do is have an authentic life. And it allows me to wake up in the morning and look at that man in the mirror and be proud of who I see because he's authentic in his interactions. Yes. Thank you. So 
Oh, Harmy. All right. Okay, so benefits. One great thing about more people coming out as ex-Muslims is that it shows that we don't have to hope for a reformed version of Islam. It is more than possible for people to leave Islam. Are we here to fight for the truth or pick and choose from lies one we consider less harmful to us? We are normalizing fighting Islam as we fight all religions, as we fight all dogma, as we fight all superstition. Instead of denying Muslims an alternative to superstitious beliefs, and instead of replacing one form of delusion with another that might be less harmful to us, but leaves Muslims as victims of their own dogma. A reformed version of Islam still involves believing in things without evidence. That is the source of our problems. If we don't fight believing in harmless nonsense without evidence, we are also allowing believing in harmful nonsense without evidence. Promoting Islamic reform is promoting Islam. We don't want to be involved with any promotion of Islam. We want to fight Islam. Islam as a whole doesn't make sense. So why would we support nonsense? If an idea makes no sense, you call it out as nonsense, whether it's harming you personally or not. Our presence here as ex-Muslims is demonstrating to the world that leaving Islam is not just possible, but it's more common than you might think. So that was the benefits. Costs. So yesterday here, they gave out balloons with the names of victims of Islams on each. The one I got was Hossein Sudman from Iran, who was executed for leaving Islam. I'm from Iran, and I became an atheist before leaving Iran. So I thought to myself, that could have been me. I later started Atheist Republic. I wrote a book called Why There Is No God, and I started an ex-Muslim podcast called Secular Jihadists from the Middle East, which you all should check out, by the way, if you like podcasts. <laughs> We only recently got started, and we have had more than 100,000 downloads, and many of them is from Egypt, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia. The point is, I'm very much open and out about my atheism, and I'm sure I, I'll get hanged if I go back to Iran. So when my mom got cancer, I couldn't go see her in Tehran. But she didn't want to die without seeing her son. Against doctor's advice, she left the hospital and came to Vancouver, where I live. She had stage, st stage three pancreatic cancer, and she wasn't supposed to leave the hospital. She died soon after coming to Vancouver. So I guess I consider my openness of my atheism responsible for having, having done that to her. So, does it that way? Does the benefits outweigh the cost? Whether the benefits at, outweigh the cost for being open about atheism or being open about your ex-Muslim depends on the ex-Muslim and the environment she's in. It also depends on each person's tolerance for risk and tolerance for negative reactions that they'll get. But to ex-Muslims out there, who are considering being, being open, I ask you to consider that whatever difficulties you face, your openness will help normalize and reduce those difficulties for ex-Muslims coming after you. For me personally, I don't know, you would have to ask my mom. 
But that, that was the end of what I have here. But I want to also agree, I'm glad you brought it up, that I, don't, I totally don't understand this whole Islam, Islamism. Um, Islam is Islamism. The word Islamism is used to suggest that Islam can be accepted if it's not political. But Islam is political by nature. So Noura, you're speaking close there. Sure. Hello everyone, my name is Noura Mbebi, and can everybody hear me? Um, so as Dan mentioned, um, I'm the president of an organization based out of the United States called Muslimish. And I'm very, very happy to be on this panel today because I think that um, the topic of being out loud and proud is something that relates very, very strongly to us as an organization. Um, we do have a full spectrum of people who come to us in New York um, and in Detroit, Atlanta, a few other cities that um, are on the border, they're sort of questioning, they have some things in Islam that don't sit well with them, and they don't know who to speak to, because the notion of questioning is not accepted in their households, in their communities. So we try and offer that space. Now the group has some members who are very out loud and proud, and some members who are far from it. Um, and I think I love the, the idea of analyzing the pros and cons. I'll start with the pros because I think um, I'm, I'll build on what Jimmy and Armin have already said so eloquently. When it comes to um, being out as an atheist in a community, um, even a Muslim community in the West, in a Western country, um, a lot of these atheists are serving as trailblazers for those who are less comfortable and less willing to speak about their views. I know that when I first joined my support at Muslimish, um, I had been an atheist for years, um, and yet it was my first time meeting another ex-Muslim, and during my very first meeting, there were a lot of blasphemous things said at the meeting. And I remember being shocked. I wasn't offended because I agreed with many of them, but I was shocked. And it served to remove a lot of the stigma, a lot of the shame that we uh, internalize very early on to criticize Islam. And the, the word normalize has been thrown around a lot here today and, I'm, and yesterday, and I'm so happy to continue to throw it around because I think we experience a lot of stigma as ex-Muslims or even those who are still Muslim but, but question and criticize Islam. And um, that stigma silences us. I think it's important to know that the silence, that um, the cost of the silence is, is too high. Should we remain silent, we become an invisible group of people. And when we're invisible, we don't have the opportunity to make contact um, with others as who we really are. As Jimmy so eloquently said, our authentic selves. So if all of us as ex-Muslims chose instead to keep our views to ourselves and placated and, and, or, or just kept the peace, um, ultimately what would happen is um, those who start to question would not know that there are others like them. And without the contact, we can't normalize our existence and we cannot reduce stigma. So it serves as a vicious circle. The silence occurs because of the stigma and continued silence perpetuates the stigma even further. So by being visible and being out, um, we can um, reduce certain feelings that we grow up with, like notions of disgust and fear, the unfamiliarity of an atheist. Uh, the word secular in, in Egypt um, was often used, it's used as almost like a profane word. Um, if we can reduce that, if we can desensitize people 
to hearing or seeing what we look like or how we sound like or our views. Um, that is a positive step. That's a step in the right direction. So uh, being visible humanizes us. In, in the worst case scenario, at least someone knows what an ex-Muslim looks like, even if they can hardly tolerate us, but at least, you know, they've seen at least one. And in the best case scenario, maybe they realize we're not so bad after all, and maybe they'll question, well, I don't think this person deserves to go to hell. So we discussed the cost of invisibility, and um, what I'll say is being out loud and proud for um, our own community helps us to um, mobilize and inspire our fellow ex-Muslims. Just being at this conference, for me, has energized me so much. And I think that um, we, serve, we serve as big motivators to each other. So that brings me to thinking about our audience. And this will sort of uh, lead to the cons. I think that um, being loud, I'll just take the loud part, um, sometimes has um, impacts that we wish they wouldn't have on people who are outside of our community. Even I would say ex-Muslims who are not joining ex-Muslim communities because they are out there. Um, we in this room are sort of um, already implicitly uh, have shared mentality because we showed up to this conference. Um, but there are ex-Muslims who I've heard speak to me and say, well, why should you even have an organization? Why do you meet as a group? Why do you talk about things? Just, just be skeptical by yourself, and you, these, these things don't need to be spoken about. And I think that the root of it is silencing is stigma as well, and I think that should be countered. I think that... Um, the, the, though it is uncomfortable for others to listen to these perspectives, um, we can manage the ways in which we put them out there. So um, I'm kind of jumping a little bit further, but um, the question to me is not whether or not to be out. It's how are we going to be out in a strategic, intelligent, um, uh, calculated, calculated has a negative connotation, but think of it in the most positive sense, calculated way, in a measured way. I know for sure that um, there are people in my family, people in my community who accept me as an ex-Muslim because they know the full, the full breadth of who I am as a, as a human being. And I think had they just heard me say one blasphemous thing, which I would say, um, they may shut down and decide not to hear me out at all. And I think this happens to a lot of ex-Muslims. I think um, because people do not know them on a personal level, they are easier to paint as a kafir, um, you know, whatever, X, Y, or Z. So I think that we as a community could start um, thinking about how do we communicate with other people and what is our purpose, what is our intention? If our intention, as a lot of people are saying here, is to normalize criticism of Islam and humanize us as, as ex-Muslims, we need to now think about, well, how can I best do that without putting people's defenses up? Now this, in, it, to me, it's very, very strong an opinion that this does not include compromise. This does not mean not sharing what, how we really think and feel. I think this is more about the way that we communicate. Um, and I think, just as Bonia Ahmed said on the, in the very first day in the morning, that we need to think about what the complexities of religion include. We need to really examine that. I think we also need to examine the complexities of the human psyche. What conditions, under what conditions is someone most likely to feel compassionate? Under what conditions could they have a conversation? When, uh, under what conditions could we start a dialogue? with ex-Muslims and have people hear us out. So when it comes to pros versus cons, I would say I am all for being out. Um, I think the pros definitely outweigh the cons, but the biggest con is your personal safety. And I think that that is paramount. Um, it is obviously the individual's choice how far to go within their communities. I know that in New York and the United States, I, I I feel a measure of safety, 
and I can speak out publicly without feeling danger to myself. Um, but I think that if it, if it comes to bodily harm, um, and even psychological harm, um, I think we need to be very careful. Um, but I think when it is safe for you to do so, being out serves so, so many people. It serves the ex-Muslims who come after you. Um, and whenever you can, come out one step at a time to a friend, a close friend, a loved one. Um, do it at your pace, and I think it will lead to a lot of great things. Hi, everyone. Um, I observe uh, that one of the most important pluses are that many ex-Muslims contacting us and even want to join us who, who didn't uh, stand as an ex-Muslim before in public. It's absolutely fantastic for me to see that we have managed to give courage to others. For example, like Mariam Namazi, Salman Rushdie, Ali Sina, or Ayan Hirsi Ali, and many others gave courage to thousands of others before for to stand up as an ex-Muslim. Because many Muslims out there actually non-Muslim. And the other things is that to be witness that our uh, enlightenment works, critics, and our personal stories creating critical thinking and push someone to research the Islamic sources. And the best thing to see that we are helping someone to wake up from the religious dogmas. The, another very important plus is we have a lot of support from the ethnic Norwegian people who never been Muslim before. And the people who was even afraid to use their uh, freedom of speech against Islam to avoid being calling ras uh, racist or Islamophobe. They thanks us and they are happy. They say, finally, where you, ha where you have been before. So they get also courage to criticize Islam as any other religion and ideas. We can already see that uh, debate climate is changing in Norway. Although uh, there are many difficulties, tries to stop us. Even the, some of the most ex extreme people who fight against Muslims, not the ideas, we ex-Muslims succeeded to change them. We know the fact that even an imam or a religious leader who actually fighting racism, against racism, can never succeed at that. Indeed, they will create more racism because they have no credibility in the West. But we have, because we create humanity and love. And the other thing, the telling the personal stories are very important. I was a Muslim. I felt that only all the Muslims in the world are my brothers and sisters. We live together and we die together. But I never used my head. The Islamic clerics, the Quran and Muhammad who gave me all the thoughts. Today I'm an ex-Muslim. I feel that every human being are my brothers and sisters. And now I'm thinking self, using my head. I do not let Muhammad think on behalf of me. My values are from the human rights, not from the Quran. I expand my nation from only the Muslims to every human being. 
I confess that. The ex-Muslims of Norway hate. We hate religions. Cultures which are incompatible with the modern values. Dogmas and every value which separate human being from another. But we do not hate human beings. Our mission when we criticize the religion is love. We, we love the religious people. So we want to make them free from dogmas. And the minuses, the one of the biggest minuses are still the fear of religion. You are safe inside and danger outside. As an ex-Muslim, you do not feel yourself safe and free, even not in Norway, not in any Western countries. Because Islam is dangerous in any society. Because this religion does not understand humanity and inclusion. Our mission is to inform about that and reform it. The other meanings are that we have got today the Islamo left, I call, in Norway and in the West, which are against the ex-Muslims movement but love to support and choose monks from seventh centuries as community leader and dialogue partners. We know all together that the Islamists in the West, which exist in the, in the mosques, that they hate the Western values. They love only the freedom of religion because this value let them practice their Islam. And they have, have no supporters in the West, but the left, the Islamo left, you call far left, so don't misunderstand. I don't say every left, but the Islamo left. I wonder if somebody can protest against me when I say the truth from my heart. The Islamo leftists are the fifth column. They are the fifth column because they betray the humanism and support to enemies of civil civilizations. And the one thing more uh, negative I meet every day, even in Norway, one little country, the coalition, the big coalition, I call uh, that the Chinese wall. Because when I stand out loud and proud, as an ex-Muslim and begin to criticize Islam without being politically correct, then the Islamo left attacking me and calling me anti-Muslim, as Muslim hater, as the man who wants uh, some career, and associating me uh, with the far right. And the far right accusing me to doing taqiyya, Takiya means actually that you, you can lie for cause of Islam. Even when I stand as an atheist, not so-called moderate, liberal, or secular Muslim, or cultural Muslim, still this, that happens. The new Western feminists who even not want to mention child hijab, FGM, uh, burqa, forced marriage, indeed prefer to campaign against like porn industry, calls me a shame for my illiterate mother because of I talk of my mother in public and give an example, her life. And they say I'm anti-woman even. Because um, they say advocating woman's freedom is not my business. The so-called moderate Muslims Moderate Muslims calling me as a coconut, mm -hmm. white inside, dark outside. It is very funny that they still don't learn what is meant to have solidarity to country which they are living in, even after many generations. And they are accusing me to spread hatred against Muslims and helping the far right. And of course, accusing me to get paid by Jews 
for blackmailing Islam. The Islamists are the same as before. They attacking with harassment and hatred. So the summary of the minuses we meet every day is a, I call the not collaborating big allies, allies, ally, uh, allies. alliance, alliance. Yes, <laughs> thank you. The Chinese war. With the same goal, who working continually to delegitimizing us, discredit us, and att attending to make us invisible in public. I have to fight with all this paper first for only to come to the point. Unfortunately, even in this part of the world which has experience with the reformation uh, process of Christianity, it is not very easy to stand as an ex-Muslim and criticize a man who lived with 1,400 years ago, a book full of absurdities and practices of people who have that ideology with, uh, which against humanity. And the last I can say, uh, or oh, outway, outway, yeah. Outway. Uh, f for me, every single plus is out outway uh, to negative ones. One uh, only because of every single positive is much more important than important and v valuable. Uh, for humanity and gives hope for our future. I see even only one person who managed to make himself free from dogmas give hope. And this is more important than 10 negative things for me. And I knew, and, and we all knew it before, when we call ourselves ex-Muslim, there will be many difficulties even in Western countries in front of us. Thank you. Asher. So I think that I've come maybe from a little bit of a different background to most of the rest of the panel. I came from a kind of secular Jewish background, so I'm not sure whether that was, there was so much of a transition to become an atheist in a way. But um, I think certainly there were more cons when I went to university and started a, a, an atheist society and had the good fortune to be, in co to be put into contact with Mariam, who we invited to give a talk. Um, that talk was, uh, we had invited the Islamic Society as well, and um, it, it sort of devolved into uh, hatred and, and infighting, and there were kind of death threats which were made, and uh, it became a bit of a media story. Um, and sort of bizarrely afterwards, the LGBT society at our university actually did not defend Maryam and defended the guys from the Islamic society who had come in and disrupted the meeting and tried to shut her down from speaking. Um, so that was, and we kind of faced a lot of hostility after that. So the way we responded to it was to invite her again the following year. Um, and to <laughs> try to have <clears throat> and we try to organize this again much to the I think kind of fury of the student union who were not very happy about this and refused our right to film the event um, we disobeyed that and brought cameras anyway to, to film it. Um, there was kind of a lot of security and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it went ahead. Uh, there were, I think, only one death threat that time as opposed to two from last time. So I suppose you could see that in, as a form of progress, albeit somewhat bitter, <laughs> a bitter truth. But, um, yeah, so I think that it was very demoralizing to see uh, much of the student body kind of not come out and defend us, and particularly uh, 
societies which one might expect to do so, like the LGBT society. Um, and I think that a lot of the hostility that we faced was them suggesting that we were right-wing and that we were bigoted and Islamophobic, and indeed, um, somewhat absurdly, that Mariam was as well. Um, so I suppose those are the cons of, of, of being uh, out loud and proud in that particular circumstance. But I mean, I think that the suddenly taking a contrarian stance should always be seen as a good thing. And I think it is disappointing in a way that uh, freedom of speech is beginning to be seen as something which is right wing um, to defend it. I think that freedom of speech should precede all political discussion. It should be a right which both sides affirm is true rather than being a partisan issue which, we, which only one side or more so seems to defend. Um, I think that I'm certainly glad that there isn't a kind of de jour blasphemy law. Um, and I feel lucky uh, to be in that position in this country. But I think there are segments of the left as well which have, and certainly not all, um, as we know by being here, but there are segments which have created a kind of de facto blasphemy law almost. Uh, it's certainly an, an encroachment and it's sort of a coercive tactic. Um, I think by suppressing legitimate criticism of religion with the tarnish of Islamophobia um, and not distinguishing between religion and uh, as something, as an ideology which can be criticized and of course Muslims uh, who should be, their right to believe in Islam should be uh, defended and we would not support anyone who, who engages in Muslim hatred. Um, but I think this tarnish of Islamophobia kind of creates an, a vacuum into which the far right can emerge. Um, and it makes it very difficult to have kind of an intellectually honest discussion of the harms of religion and to protect secularism and universal human rights. Um, I think that this sort of reiterates the importance of universities being bastions of freedom of expression and I think it's a great tragedy that I see this as being under threat to an extent. Um, I think this conference is absolutely a step in the right direction. Um, um, yeah, so I suppose the, the, the pros do outweigh the cons, but um, I think there is a lot of hostility to freedom of expression and uh, unfortunately, as a betrayal of much of history, uh, it is increasingly coming from segments of the left. Um, so, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. So. Hello. I would like to first thank Mariam Nemazi, the, bra the bravest woman I know, for hosting this. Uh, I'm Mohammed al Kadra. One day, four years ago, I was becoming more and more Salafi, and I was believing in the caliphate and having that caliphate to, to be the greatest Arab nation or the Muslim nation back again. And then this man, Richard Dawkins, <laughs> I said. <laughs> I found a YouTube video of him, and then I began to learn and learn more. And then I woke up. To be able to, to wake someone up, that's what stands for, for being out loud and proud. Because if he wasn't, I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there's the same situation for a lot of people here. To be out loud and proud is to give a chance to people who are in the closet to come out. You give a chance to people to think, how do I know what I know? How do I know that the earth is round? How do I know about the theory of evolution? There's someone that says, okay, it's creationism. I need to find out. 
this debate and this reasoning with people, you can't have that while you're hiding. And I know that a lot of people here are open, but to be open in the Middle East is something else. In August 2016, Nahid Hattar, he's a journalist, he's an atheist, he published a cartoon about the god of ISIS. It showed that this is what jihadists look for in heaven. The whole country was calling for the government to get him. And they did. And after getting him, while he was going up to the stairs in the courthouse, he was shot to death on the 25th of September last year. This is the con, and this is the major con for being out. Death is what we are fearing. But the problem is, and what's the saddest thing I have seen these two days, that Mariam said that the tsunami is coming in the opening of this conference. Yes, the tsunami is coming, but it's coming from us, from the ones who are on the front line. But here, you guys are losing. Yesterday at night, I had a, a small paper that says, awesome without Allah. And we left here, and we went to have dinner. An ex-Muslim girl with me at the conference grabbed me and took away that sign. And I asked her why. She said, because there are Muslims next to us. We might get in trouble. This is in London. This is in the 21st century. This is in the free world. Where are your priorities? While we die there, you're all thinking about Islamophobia. You're all thinking about not going. People are getting put to death because of, th of this fascist, theocratic religion. And all you think about is how can we give them more space? And how can we give them more rights? Let me tell you something. Islam is very powerful. It's super powerful. It has the oil, the money, the countries. But here, it's a small minority that needs special rights. Sharia courts. I asked a lot of you outside, why do you have faith schools? If I had a school that teaches a political system to children to kill others, would it be okay here in the UK or in the States? Why do you have schools to brainwash children? Why do you have schools that would bring up extremists? Why do you have schools that teach children that I should be put to death, that I have to live every day as a target and be okay with it and live with it. And if I say a word, if I say that Islam is bad, I'm an Islamophobe and I should shut up. This is it. What is the most extreme thing that atheists did? And yet we hear debating about, is it okay to curse at Islam or not? Is it okay to draw a cartoon or not? Or should we be more tolerant? Yeah, we can be more tolerant. Would the other side be more tolerant? Would the other side give us what they are claiming? If Islam is the most powerful force in England, will it give you the rights that you're giving them? And I'm not asking you to take away the rights of religion. But I'm asking you to face that tsunami that's coming to you and to encourage that tsunami that we are doing by facing them off and by saying no. No, I, I can leave and I can say that there is no God and I can believe in evolution and I can discuss science anytime I want and with everybody I want. This is the major con. There's a small one. I can lose my civil rights. 
if somebody files a lawsuit against me in Jordan, but I don't care. In the pros, we try at the atheist group in Jordan to help each other and to stand with each other. I know we are like a hundred and something. It's a small number. But to reach that after nobody was knowing anybody face to face is enough for me. And to have this number grow up every day in hundreds is enough for me. <laughs> being out is being able to speak and to be who you are. So if we think about which is better, the, the cons or the pros, I will definitely pick the pros. Why? Because you can never live with yourself. Anybody, you can't live with yourself if you just choose to be quiet. And this is what you are doing. You're being quiet while we're not. And look what we are having to give and what you are giving. You're giving your freedom and we're giving our life. Don't give up the things that you have. You have freedom of speech. Use it. You have the freedom to offend. And someone here said a few hours ago that apostasy is not part of Islam. And I would just like to say that if apostasy is not part of Islam, then how come all the deaths and all the butchering of us that happened, <coughs> let alone something, that by doing this, by saying that Islam, yeah, we'll, we'll take this part out of it, we're doing something very harmful. We're taking the gun and cleaning it of the hand of the murderer and we're putting it on someone else's hand. We're saying it's politics. We're saying it's despair. If despair is what causes terrorism, there has been a lot of despair for a lot of people in a lot of places of the world. This is obvious. The dogma itself causes this, and you need to fight it. I don't care, I don't care how. I know you are secular people. You're free thinkers, you're humanists, you want to harm Muslims, but you need to fight the religion. I don't care about the names. All I hear from the Council of Fixed Muslims is Islamist and political Islam, and we're trying not to face the fact that Islam itself is the virus. And that was Mohammed's first speech. <laughs> <laughs> do, we, do we have time for questions or are we out of time? We'll take as many questions until you say uh, stop then. I just want to say thank you to everybody and take a grip on myself. Um, I just want to say to um, um, Armin, I might be out of place saying this, but um, if my son had done what you have done, I would rather join you in Vancouver than live for one day than stay at home and live for the next 20 years. She must have been so proud of you. So proud of you. Work. Oh, oh, it's worse. Okay. 
My name is Nadia Duval. I did my thesis on uh, Sayyid Qutb uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood. And one of my findings is uh, the cooperation that's been in play, you know, since the 1960s between the Americans and the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, let us think about Obama, Obama's alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood. And now Trump is allying himself to the uh, Wahhabis and they are told to reform Islam. The Wahhabis are supposed to reform Islam. This is really a joke now. <laughs> you said um, in the opening of this panel discussion, you said that uh, we all disbelieve in the same God. And I tell you that Allah is not God. Allah is the God of the Arabs. He's a pagan God and he was the, the uh, chief God for the Arabs. And then they had other female gods, Allah, al minna al Aiza. And Muhammad, you know, remember the satanic verses of Salman Rushdie, when he put in question the idea that Muhammad wanted to make concessions about the Arabs, he accepts the Allah, al minna al Aiza as minor gods, provided you accept Allah as the big god. But initially, Muhammad wanted to be part of the Abrahamic tradition. He portrayed himself as a reminder of the old traditions of Judaism and Christianity. He was called Muzakkar, reminder. When he went to Medina and he, the Jews did not accept him as part of the Abrahamic tradition, he started to talk to himself about himself in the Quran as a Nabi, a prophet. It wasn't in Mecca. Mecca was accepting, there are two stages in Islam, the Meccan Quran and the Quran Is there a has question? To, yeah. The question is when you say, that we are all disbelieving in the, the same God. I'm telling you, no, we don't disbelieve in the same God. Allah is the only demon God left on the scene today, and we have to correct this, and we, I think we have to tackle the Islamists about the Quran. Mecca and Quran is accepting. Medina Quran is not accepting. It even portrays the, the uh, Jews as apes and pigs. Does anyone want to comment on that? No, it's, it, it doesn't matter who's got it. They're not real. She makes an excellent point, but it does make a good joke, so that's not <laughs> Yeah. I want to ask all of you um, if you've had any experiences of talking about your time as believers, uh, about the social control you've experienced, or the process of your doubt uh, with any followers, uh, ex-followers of other religions? And if yes, how that experience has uh, moved you? And do you have any alliances with other ex-religious organizations such as Recovering from Religion or such? Sure. Nura wants to say something. Sure, um, thank you for that question. So, very recently, in the past year, in this year, 2017, um, Muslimish has made some alliances in New York with ex-ultra-Orthodox Jews um, in an organization named Footsteps. <laughs> Is anyone from Footsteps here? Okay, maybe not. But um, what is very, very... Um, intriguing and beautiful is that we have so much in common. And that's why I love Armin's comment that there doesn't matter. I mean, it, it, they are very similar gods. And I think that um, the, what, what's beautiful is that there's so much intersectionality there. Women from the footsteps group were sharing um, things that may, may have been beyond even what I had experienced as a Muslim, um, but there were feminist issues that crossed over um, and there were very very personal intimate things that we had experienced in our separate faiths that aligned together um, so there's that they were very open to hearing our stories um, me and I Ibrahim and I Ibrahim is the founder of Muslimish Ibrahim Abdullah he um, he and I shared our stories and just the amount of agreement was shocking um, there's also another group in New York called Formerly Fundamentalist, um, and it is an interfaith, also ex-religious organization. They have ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, 
um, ex-evangelical Christians, a lot of uh, other faiths as well in that organization. Um, so I, I think uh, another pro to being out loud and proud is you form allies. And I cannot possibly express how much I have learned from seeing these organizations that are further, de more developed than we are and who offer legal support to their members. Um, they offer uh, English tutoring for people who had only learned Yiddish in New York City, in Brooklyn, New York, their whole lives. Um, they offer so much support that I think we could learn from. Armin and then Jimmy. I just, I just want to mention one bad experience I have with when talking to ex-Christians is this constant need for them to bring up Christianity when we're talking about Islam. <laughs> yes, we know, we agree, Christianity is bullshit, but we are talking about Islam right now. It's, a, it's like going into a cancer fundraiser and saying, but what about AIDS? <laughs> like, okay, yes, AIDS is bad, but this is a fundraiser about cancer. <laughs> So um, part of the conversation was, or part of the question was about the process of doubt. And um, I just want to share this because I, I think it's not widely known and it is a frequent occurrence. So for many LGBT people who are quite religious uh, in the Muslim community, they grow up with this self-loathing uh, because gay people are seen almost as creatures rather than human and frequently described as less than animals and our execution is mandated. But what's really puzzling but uh, a common occurrence is when I speak to other LGBT Muslim people is we believed ourselves that, ex -people, that gay people should be executed. And we believed that from a position of the execution was an act of benevolence. So because being gay is the biggest sin, even worse than apostasy, if you executed a gay Muslim person and you got them when they were young, like before they managed to be gay a lot, there might still be a chance they'd get to heaven. But if you allowed a gay, ex -Muslim, a gay Muslim person to exist, they would accumulate greater and greater and greater sin and therefore would be doomed to hell. And initially I thought that I was the only person who was gay uh, from a Muslim community who thought that. And I shared this with some other uh, gay Muslim, with three others, and all three of them um, had said they had the same experience. And when you get to this stage of true apostasy, because apostasy is a bit of a journey, so you can be like, I'm an apostate, I don't believe in God, and you wake up in the morning and you think, oh my God, I made it through the night, God didn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but when you really get to this space of true apostasy, that self-loathing dissipates, because you understand that this is just a constructive patriarchal narrative made to make LGBT people conform. Uh, I just want to say it was fantastic speech uh, from Mohammed and I'm totally agree and like he say use your uh, free speech because this we need in Islam uh, and I, I want to say Islam and ask with, with somebody say to you I'm Muslim and they, you want to talk with him ask which Islam what is Islam don't don't talk with this person before you know what. You have to push the Muslims to go to the truth. They are living in a lie. And lie can expose it with the truth. Majority of Muslim people are, for me, they are ex-Muslims. They don't know the truth about Muhammad and the truth about Quran and Islam, nothing. 
Islam is Muhammad. If you take Muhammad out from it, then Islam is finished. Which Islam are you talking about? So also I want to say about uh, the last thing is about uh, free speech. You know, uh, uh, Egyptian German author, uh, the author of Islamic fascism, Hamed Abdel Samad, Samad he, he, he traveling with four or five uh, police from, this, uh, from Germany with him when he will give lecture in Sweden. And I uh, heard him, he said one, one statement he came with, and this is fantastic, I think everyone has to hear that. He say, many people are wondering why I am under police protection, why I am living such a life. I say, because we are so few who are speaking up in public. If everyone who thinks like me speaking up, I won't be in danger anymore. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I just really wanted to say thank you to everybody on the panel. Just thank you so much for everything you do every single day and that you've paved the way for all of us minions on the ground. <laughs> thank you for the sacrifices you make and the daily battles you fight. And there's so much love for you guys in this room right now. My heart is exploding right now. I just, there's so much love. And for, for all of you who have been abandoned, who have been disowned, fuck them. <laughs> We love you so much. This is a question for Mohammed. Uh, I feel we have an opportunity to understand something which totally baffles me. Mohammed, you're so obviously intelligent and articulate, and you've told us that you almost became a terrorist, a, jih a jihadist. Why? I mean, <laughs> please explain to us. I mean, Islam is obvious, fatuous nonsense. Why did you believe it? You, you, you didn't get the chance to think in Islam. You are born and you're, you're, uh, you're immediately brainwashed into being a Muslim. Actually, we have something in the faith. When the woman is pregnant, the man must come to her belly and say Islamic words to her belly. That way, he made you Muslim. Anyway, uh, oh by getting the teaching at school in Jordan and getting the, the whole education is based as well. There are a lot of classes about jihad, so you get this idea that the majority of, of the Arab world has it: is that we're not great anymore. We are third world countries. And the only way to be great again is to cling to Islam because of one verse in the Quran that's, uh, or in the Hadith, I can't really remember, that says that this Ummah, will not, if it leaves Islam, it will go down. So these, we saw ourselves like we are three third world countries and the only way back is to cling to the religion. And this is the way that we should take, and this is the country that we should have. If we do th things right, if women cover themselves, if uh, we, uh, we had imams as to issue fatwas as they want, if we had the Islamic rule and the Sharia courts, everything will be okay. Money will flow in, we'll have dominion over other countries, we'll be the, the, uh, the greatest empire, empire that happens on earth. So you get the idea of, okay, so this is my enemy, and I have to get to them. There are two ways. The first way is to come and give da'wah, to come and preach, and to get them on my side. And once I feel that, that no, I can't get them on my side, I will have to fight them. So this is what's happening here in your country. You're having both. The terrorists are bombing you, and the preachers are right in Birmingham. So th this is the idea that I had, that I should either be a preacher or should work 
with the caliphate. And one of my friends did as well. He was so smart, but he had this dogmatic belief, and he was studying civil engineering. This man traveled to Fallujah and joined ISIS and committed suicide bombing just for the name of Islam. And he was my dear friend. This is, it's like, for me, like 90% of Muslims are ticking bombs. Because I wasn't an extremist. I was a normal Muslim. Few months, you are an extremist. This is very dangerous because everybody is a ticking bomb. So they say phobia is uh, an irrational fear. But when you say Islamophobia, you have every reason to be afraid. Mm. Hmm. I, I have to say just only very, very short, I, I will try. Uh, the same situation I had, similar one. You know, I find out everyone can be the martyr. Is it, it's very easy. Just look to indoctrination and basic fundament of Islam. What is that? One God, one book, the last book, and this life is a test. This is not real life. This is a just lie. The real life is after that, and you learn later. Every Muslim even will visit to uh, hell, and they will pay the, the, these this bad things they did in the world, and later they will go to heaven. But only the Muhammad will take the speed train and ride to the seventh heaven. Only with him, those who die for Islam, a cause of Islam, will go with him. And when one, the normal guy, the moderate Muslim, or maybe not practicing Muslim gang uh, member, depression, uh, maybe uh, his girlfriend go from him, left him, he have no money, and I want to kill himself. Indeed, of a go to one bridge and jump down, like the Western doing, he say, hey, why I can, that I can do something right? Go to the Iraq, doing something, and die, and go to your 72 wives. This is very easy. And so, like you say, ticking bomb. I could be, every Muslim, radical, moderate, secular, can be jihadist in, in, in one time. If they uh, get depression, they, many, many jihadists are not Muslim even. They don't practice nothing. But they know the fundament. This life is not real. Real life is there. And if I do this action, then I will go to real life with Muhammad, with wine, honey, girls, everything. But Can I just add to that? Um, that, that it's important to understand this concept of heaven as a driver because if you are homosexual and you're condemned for hell, the idea of a suicidal jihad that will land you in heaven regardless of all of the gay sin you may have done can be very appealing. I also, I also want to respond to the question. I, we, the question, how could we ever believe in any of this nonsense? A lot of us ask ourselves that the same question. How could I ever believe any of this? Like we, like we don't know. Like once now that we look at it, I'm confused. Like why, why would I ever believe anything like this? So we don't, we don't have an answer. Maybe it is a God delusion. Yeah. <laughs> And just to add to that, um, I think there is power to the group indoctrination and group mentality. I think a lot of us believed unreasonable things just because, as people okay. keep referring to the term brainwashing, when every single person around you says the same exact thing, it becomes so powerful and it just becomes your reality. And I think that's why I love disagreement even when it happens in this room because mm. I feel that we're fighting that. Um, we are um, shedding some residual dogmatism that, that some of us still have from re being religious. And I think it's excellent for us to disagree with one another and pose different thoughts. So we're... Um So we're out of time, but it looks like Miriam wants to ask a question. Is that right? No? Well, I just want to say that.
say I love you guys as well. Thank you so much for your bravery and courage. Honestly, you are you mean the world to so many of us, so don't ever feel like you're alone. Um, I do also want to just make one political point. I'm sorry, I always go back there. I'm a political animal at heart. Is that I think that it is important to remember that there is, in my opinion, a distinction between Islam, Islamism, and Muslims. And I, I just want to make one point, and it is this. If when the death penalty was the law in Britain, you asked people if they were pro the death penalty, a vast majority would have said yes. But today, most likely, I hope, a vast majority will say no. The law and the state, the educational system, all of these have a really important, um, uh, you know, uh, important role in playing in changing people's mentality, but also saying that some things are just unacceptable. You know, you can still have domestic violence in Britain, but people will not defend it. And I think that's why the fight against Islamism is so important, because it fights against religion and power, and it gives people the space to be able to think differently, and also to live in secular societies where dissent is not a matter of life and death. And I think also, sometimes when you live in a theocracy, or when you live in suppressive and very oppressive societies, what you see and what people say in public is not necessarily what they really believe. So I have great hope in humanity and the ability of all of us, whether we're Muslims or ex-Muslims or whatever, to be able to, to change this world for the better. And I think Muslims, many of them, a vast majority of them, are our friends as well. And we have to make sure that in our criticism of Islam, unrelenting, I don't care who's uncomfortable, my job is not to make you comfortable. Unrelenting criticism of Islam, unrelenting criticism of Islamism, but a defense of human beings, even if we think their opinions are vile, even if we think their opinions are prejudiced, because they are human beings, and many human beings like us can change their minds and can, you know, and can be good and decent people despite their regressive beliefs. Thank you. And I think that's a perfect way to end the panel today. So thank you, Marianne. Thank you, uh, Dan uh, Barker and the panel. Um,